Ocean Climate, yep. Yeah. I don't think I have the script at all. Okay, I'll check on it again, Ms. Coho. Look out for an email coming from me, Ms. Uh, just hit send. See if you can get this one. I sent one too, so hopefully one of us has the right email address, Beverly. Bemidji area representative. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the, Sam, the Substance Abuse uh, Mental Health Service Ad Administration listening session of the 2021 National Tribal Health Conference. Before we begin, uh, please note that the session will be recorded. If you do not consent to being recorded, uh, we ask you to drop off the session at this time. And thank you. Okay. Uh, as is customary, we start the, we'll start this meeting in a good way. Um, I'd like to thank my co-host, uh, Beverly Coho, uh, NIHB Albuquerque area representative, uh, and ask her to provide us with an opening prayer. Thank you, Sam. Let's all pray this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day today. As each one of us as your children and grandchildren are here on Mother Earth to participate in the National Indian Health Conference to be able to produce a wonderful interaction with all the people across the nation so that we could learn more about the health afflictions that impact us from day to day and may our agenda we have today go through smoothly with everyone's participation and that our people continue to be on the path of good health and wellness. This is our ultimate intent for the one life that you have given us, Heavenly Father, to be able to keep up our mind, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, so that we could not only be of usefulness to ourselves, but to be of service to all the people that we need to serve. And these things we ask in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, uh, miigwech, Mrs. Koho. Uh, during the session, uh, we'll be speaking with uh, Dr. Miriam Delphin Rittman, Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use, and Mrs. Kimberly Binnikiz, sorry, Kimberly, uh, Public Health uh, Advisor with uh, SAMHSA. Uh, we appreciate the engagement with Do Dr. Rittman, Dr. Delphina Rittman, and we look forward to the discussion, uh, discussing a host of issues that are important to our tribal nations. I'm glad to be leading this session today with Mrs. Beverly Coho. Uh, thank you, Sam. As you mentioned, we have many important topics of discussion today on current and ongoing behavioral health challenges and disparities facing tribal nations. 
while the COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact the mental and behavioral health of tribal communities, there are many other behavioral health priorities that need our attention. These include telebehavioral health, tribal mental and behavioral health programs, the ongoing opioid epidemic, suicide prevention, funding concerns, and behavioral health integration for tribal law enforcement. We look forward to meaningful engagement and discussion today, and we welcome the opportunity to strengthen our partnership. As tribal leaders, we appreciate the time we have with the Assistant Secretary and SAMHSA leaders so that we can share our guidance and recommendations on a variety of issues. This is a dynamic time and we want to ensure that tribal leader perspectives are heard, understood, and incorporated in the agency's work. We will, <clears throat> excuse me, we will begin today with some updates from Dr. Delphin Rittman. This will be followed by the open discussion portion of the meeting. And now to start us off with some important SAMHSA updates. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Delphin Rittman. Dr. Delphin Rittman is currently Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Abuse in the United States Department of Health and Human Services and the Administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. In her current and previous work, Dr. Delphin Rittman has been committed to promoting services and systems that are culturally responsive and foster dignity, respect, and meaningful community inclusion. Dr. Delphin Rittman is joined by Kimberly Beniquis, Public Health Advisor and Acting Director of the Office of Indian Alcohol and Substance Abuse. Thank you both for making the time to be with us for this important meeting. I will turn the floor over to Dr. Delphin Rittman. Doctor? Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Coe, and, and I just appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here uh, with you all. Uh, I know Kimberly does as well. Uh, and so looking forward to the conversation and the discussion. Uh, and so my remarks will be brief so we can really get right into the discussion. Um, I'm a clinical community psychologist by training and, and just as part of my background, I, I love what comes out of uh, sort of dynamic uh, discussions when the space is created to have those. So I'm really looking forward to that uh, part of our session. Um, but I did want to provide a few updates in terms of some of SAMHSA's work uh, currently and, uh, and also wanted to assure uh, the tribal leaders that in my role as Assistant Secretary, I am committed uh, to continuing our partnership uh, and the critical work uh, that we have uh, addressing the needs of our tribal citizens. And so I did want to just share that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I wanted to share a little bit in terms of, you know, SAMHSA's infrastructure that we currently have in place uh, to be able to uh, address our tribal uh, behavioral health uh, uh, needs and, and the work related to the tribal communities. Um, SAMHSA does have a, an office of, uh, it's, we call it our intergovernmental tribal or intergovernmental and external affairs. And as part of that office, we have an office of tribal affairs and policy. Um, Kimberly is currently uh, leading that in an acting role. And we do have a, a new director coming on uh, very soon. And so we're really pleased uh, about that as well. And uh, so appreciate Kimberly's leadership in uh, leading the office. Um, so, you know, SAMHSA, our, our work is about sort of addressing, as you know, the behavioral health of the nation. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is share some of the areas of uh, work and funding uh, that we have related to tribal affairs, um, but want to step back a little bit and, and share a little bit of data that we have related to 
uh, behavioral health within tribal communities and do a bit of context setting um, before getting into some of the uh, specific grant programs and initiatives. Um, you know, I just, I believe that it's so important to look at the data that we have, um, to be able to understand patterns and trends, uh, and then to be able to do meaningful, you know, meaningful planning based on what uh, data and, and history, if you will, is telling us. Um, one thing that we know and, and that uh, you know, many of the uh, tribal communities that we've worked with uh, have, have just shared just the range of experiences that uh, as a function of intergenerational trauma that are still impacting. And so we know uh, many of the behavioral health patterns and trends uh, that I'll talk about in many instances, uh, integrational, intergenerational trauma um, is uh, impacting the, the patterns and trends that we'll see, we're seeing. Um, the other thing that we know is that uh, tribal communities are often disproportionately impacted by disparities. And so our work, uh, we're very much interested in helping to mitigate and address those disparities in a way that uh, we're able to promote health equity. I'm gonna share a little bit of our 2019 data. Uh, this will be our pre-pandemic uh, data. Uh, very soon, we'll be have our 2020 data will be coming out through our NISDA, we call it our National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and that re report will be out soon. But I do want to share some of the patterns and trends that we've, we've seen in some of our previous uh, reports. Um, in some ways, it will give us information about sort of where we were pre-pandemic, so that when the 2020 report comes out, we'll be able to see some of the specific impacts of the, of the pandemic. But our data shows us that, for example, um, American Indian and Alaskan Natives at 10% uh, of individuals 18 or years or older uh, struggle with substance use disorder. Um, and that also alcohol use disorder uh, that has increased uh, slightly uh, for individuals uh, age 18 to 25. Um, we also know that, you know, as we're seeing uh, patterns and trends related to increases of opioids, uh, within the American Indian and Alaska Native pop population, uh, individuals age 12 to 17, uh, opioid misuse and pres prescription pain, uh, uh, pain reliever misuse uh, has also increased slightly from 2018, uh, but it has decreased in all other groups. And so I think that is a significant pattern to, uh, to note uh, that in all other groups, the pattern uh, slightly decreased. Um, and then we do see uh, about 80,000 uh, American Indian and Alaska Native individuals age 12 or older um, who report opioid misuse. Uh, so a, a challenge and a pattern certainly that we're seeing um, across the country to include within American Indian and Alaska Native groups. Uh, next slide, please. You know, one thing that we're still really proud of and, and in many ways it still guides our work today uh, is the Tribal Behavioral Health Agenda. Um, you know, this document has six cross-cutting components uh, that have been so informative in terms of guiding our, our work. Uh, those are essentially youth, culture, identity, uh, individual self, uh, individual self-sufficiency rather, data and tribal leadership. Um, and then there's five foundational elements as well, which these priorities are, are sort of based upon. Um, and that is historical and intergenerational trauma, um, socio-ecological approach, we know how important that is to take a socio-ecological approach, uh, prevention and recovery support, behavioral health and behavioral health systems and support, uh, and national awareness and visibility. Um, and so this report, it was developed in 2016, but again, it, it, it still um, informs our work. Uh, and it was developed through quite a collaborative process with uh, tribal leaders, uh, and uh, community groups really across the country. Uh, and so again, it's, it's a document that is uh, informative to our work uh, and has, has certainly stood the test uh, of time, if you will. Um, next slide, please. So I wanna share a little bit about some of the um, grants and, and funding that we have in place to address some of the patterns and trends that we talked about. Uh, one, we, we have a series of tribal only grants. And so these grants are specifically for uh, tribal communities. Um, and as you know, so those are Native Connections, uh, Circle of Care, um, the Tribal Opioid Response Grant, uh, fairly significant award 
uh, geared towards addressing uh, opioid uh, as well as stimulant uh, issues and challenges that we're seeing within communities. Uh, often this program funds uh, initiatives and programs in the area of prevention, treatment and recovery and intervention. And so uh, an important area of, of work and we appreciate the partnership around that, uh, that particular grant. Um, we also have a number of set-asides, uh, or excuse me, a number of discretionary grants uh, to, to tribes and tribal organizations uh, and urban Indian health organizations. And, and these grants often will, uh, and other grants as well, include set-asides uh, within, within the grants, particularly for tribal organizations. Next slide, please. Uh, Want to go through real quickly just some of the specific funding uh, funding awards that have been uh, disseminated over the past year. Uh, so there's the Coronavirus uh, Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Uh, about 15 million uh, has been disseminated to address tribal needs, specifically related to COVID-19. You know, there've been a, a lot of needs that have arisen there. Um, the ripple effects of COVID in terms of the uh, increased rates of anxiety, depression, uh, increased rates of substance use. And so many of these resources were part of the president's uh, plan and, and approach of taking bold action to address the, the needs of tribal communities. Um, also through the, our Consolidated Appropriation Act 2021, uh, there's been about 125 million set aside to address tribal needs related to uh, COVID-19 uh, within that award as well. Some of the specific programs uh, that have been awarded uh, Project AWARE, uh, there's been uh, about 24 million uh, awarded to tribal grantees for our Project AWARE grant. Uh, Project AWARE is, a, is a, a wonderful program geared towards uh, addressing, aware, or addressing resiliency uh, and mental health awareness among youth within school settings. Uh, and so really creative work uh, that is implemented through that initiative. And so again, 24 million. Uh, has been disseminated to tribal communities for our Project AWARE grant. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing that, that has been uh, a key part of our work is, is being able to offer uh, training and technical assistance uh, to our grantees and to communities that are working with uh, tribal communities as well. Um, so we do have, a, in particular, a, a tribal training and technical assistance center uh, that is funded to offer training and technical assistance uh, to our tribal grantees, as well as to other uh, community groups that may be working uh, with tribal communities as well. Uh, and then we also have the Native American Indian uh, and Alaska Native Technology Transfer Center. Uh, also, it provides training and technical assistance uh, for uh, tribal grantees as well as uh, other grantees as well. So I just wanted to you know, provide just a quick update. Again, so appreciate the partnership. Looking forward to our conversation. Uh, appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, and I'll stop there. And uh, we're happy to have a uh, discussion and conversation now. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for those updates. Um, and that's important information. Now we will start the discussion portion of the meeting. Uh, like other listening sessions, we will follow tribal protocol and invite our tribal um, elected tribal leaders to make comments, share recommendations, ask questions um, first. Uh, once our tribal leaders had a chance to speak, we will open the floor to other members of our audience. Um, our NIHB uh, board of directors have a few questions to start us off with. Uh, I'd like to invite my fellow board member, Beverly Coho, to ask uh, the first questions. Miigwech. Thank you, Sam. Good morning. Good morning. We, we have questions about services and support for our communities as we deal with the short and long-term impacts of COVID-19 on mental and behavioral health. We need to take steps to help lessen the mental and behavioral health consequences associated with COVID-19 and help people cope and heal. In addition to services related to the 
impacts of COVID-19. We need prevention programming for vulnerable populations that promotes wellness and healing across generations. I have a few questions that I'd like to ask. First, what support services and resources will be available for those experiencing mental or behavioral health impacts from COVID-19 currently and as we continue to move through pandemic? Also, is SAMHSA looking into any links to increase to increases in suicides due to the pandemic? If so, will that information be shared with tribes? Will there be additional funding to address these issues? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for those questions. I, I, I do appreciate the, the questions and comments. And you know, you're right, when, when we look at data, uh, CDC has reported some increases uh, in suicide rates across the country, uh, you know, over the past year. Um, and so there is some data available that, that um, highlights those trends. Um, our current uh, NISDA, which will be coming out, so that's the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, um, that would be able to potentially offer additional information uh, you know, related to behavioral health trends. And, and that should be out soon. And that data really will speak more directly to uh, the uh, patterns and trends uh, as a function of the pandemic or, or over the past year, certainly. Uh, so we're happy to share that data as that becomes available as well. Um, the other thing in, in terms of funding, yeah, I mean, the, the funding that I had mentioned, uh, we are committed to uh, ensuring that resources are available to address the behavioral health needs um, of tribal communities. Uh, so again, the Project AWARE grant uh, is a grant that is available um, and about 24 million has been awarded in Project AWARE. Um, and that is a grant that's stood up often in, within school settings. So, so to help young people and, and children uh, struggling with uh, behavioral health challenges uh, as a function of the pandemic. Um, it also offers training for teachers and individuals within a school setting to be able to recognize when a young person might be struggling or, or might be beginning to have difficulties. And, and that piece is really important as well, the, the people around the young person who are supporting them uh, to be able to recognize when that person is struggling. Um, so that's a grant that it, it is one that we've been scaling up really throughout the pandemic. Um, we've also uh, offered or disseminated funding for a community, we call them CCBHCs, so Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinics. Uh, and those are available uh, across the country as well to, to include within tribal communities uh, and offer um, integrated care. So both mental health and substance use services, um, as well as links to primary care uh, services and supports as well. Um, and so those are just a, a couple examples. Um, I will ask Kimberly to share as well uh, in terms of some additional specifics related to uh, grants and awards that may be available, uh, that have been available and that may be available coming up. So Kimberly, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I just want to reiterate, as was mentioned in the Assistant Secretary's presentation, the emergency COVID funds that were available to tribes and then additional supplements that were available um, to tribes and tribal communities. And those tribes could really identify what needs were most prevalent in their own communities. I will tell you also internally at SAMHSA, our Office of Tribal Affairs and Policy is working very closely with our suicide prevention branch. And especially because of the rollout of our suicide lifeline transitioning from a 10 digit number to the three digit 988 number and really taking a look at what may be the obstacles in tribal communities with the rollout of that 988 and really seeing how we can problem solve prior to that rollout. Thank you for that response. Um, now I'd like to invite my fellow board member, uh, Councilman Nick Lewis to ask a question. Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, my name is Nicholas, uh, sorry, Nicholas Lewis, council member for Lummi Nation, vice chairman on the National Indian Health Board and chairman of the uh, Portland Area Indian Health Board and also the primary 
uh, SAMHSA uh, TTAG rep for the uh, SAMHSA. So thank you guys for being here on this important discussion. And I was glad to hear you guys talk about some of the grants, you know, Project AWARE, the Tribal uh, Continuum of Care, the Tribal Specific Grants. And I just wanted to, to make uh, mention that the competitive grant process pits tribe against tribe and each other as they try to secure funding. Further tribes often must compete against more established entities for significant federal dollars. As a result, we often see tribes lose out on those opportunities. We believe that tribes should have uh, not be made to compete against one another for funding when, uh, when it comes to healthcare and, and talking about mental health, that is healthcare. Those are trust responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And so we'd like to really challenge and see SAMHSA uh, get, get more involved and, and stop making it so competitive and, and putting tribe against tribe uh, for those dollars. Um, one of the things I'd, I'd like to talk about or, or hear more about also is I, I talk with our grant here that we have here at Lummi. So, so I'm trying to understand how, how things work on the ground level. And I've seen and talked with other tribes as well that had to return dollars for whatever reason. One of the main reasons for that is we can't fill positions. If you're in a rural county, it's hard to attract people at some of the pay scales we have to. And I've heard of a number of tribes that have had to send large amounts of money back to SAMHSA. And that, that's concerning. You know, if tribes are doing everything that they can, and for some reason they can't get people hired, we're, we're seeing shortages across the health industry now. Um, we need to make sure that tribes don't have to return that, that those funding, and if they need to file for an extension, or if there's even turnovers in grant that SAMHSA provide additional training to new staff that comes on to help get that new staff caught up. I've seen where staff turnover in grants, and, and we don't get that support, and the new staff is trying to catch up. And by the time they get caught up, the grant's wrapping up. Um, and so I'd like to see um, more emphasis on that. I'd also like to see a report from SAMHSA about how many uh, dollars have been returned to SAMHSA from tribes, tribal grants. Um, and so that we, the SAMHSA advisory committee and tribes can start to understand what those problem, what those challenges are. Why are these dollars having to come back? And then you know, as I understand it, that just goes into the black hole back into the government when dollars are returned and really just hurts tribes even more when there's already a shortage of federal dollars. So I just like to talk about those things a little bit more and, and see SAMHSA start to address those, um, knowing that uh, tribes are struggling with funding more now than ever because of COVID and returning dollars does not help our people uh, who are the focus. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. So I'll start and then I'll ask Kimberly to, to chime in as well. Um, I appreciate you raising those concerns, particularly the, uh, you know, some of the challenges related to um, applying for grants in terms of the competition, as well as the uh, issue you relate, raise related to resources and having to send resources back. Um, what you shared is a challenge that we're hearing really across the country that people are having struggles and having a hard time with, with hiring staff. Um, so certainly, you know, where we're able to moving forward, we're, we're having conversations and, and want to be able to be as supportive um, as we're able to be in terms of um, management of the resources, uh, but also any assistance that, or ideas we can offer in terms of hiring. Um, but definitely are having conversations around how we can make the grant process um, easier. Uh, and we're open to uh, exploring and, and looking at what we can do in terms of funds that aren't um, expended by the end of the grant period. So we're, we're open to discussions there. Um, Kimberly, is there anything else that you wanna add related to that? Yeah, I just, just a couple of things to elaborate. We've started to take a look at our sister agencies within HHS to see, <clears throat> excuse me, exactly what they require in terms of grant applications. Um, to see kind of where there's similarities and where there's differences and really what leverage do we have to make changes in those areas. Um, and also, um, I wanted to mention something that, that you brought up and that's really working with our grantees when there's changes in staff. And we have started to do that, at least on a small scale. And I agree, we can broaden that and make that better. But we started to work with grantees in our tour program, the Tribal Opioid Response, to really train new staff 
on what the requirements are, kind of how to work our, in our database systems and things like that. And we hope to broaden that to our other tribal only grants and basically all of our discretionary grants so that we can be as helpful as possible when there is a transition. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, I have one additional question uh, before we open it up to the floor. Um, it's kind of a follow-up question and, and Nick had raised this, Councilman Lewis had raised this. Uh, while we appreciate uh, SAMHSA trying to reduce the reporting burden on providers and patients, uh, we wish to raise concern about the ongoing GIPA reporting at SAMHSA. Uh, SAMHSA GIPA reporting measures have been a massive burden on providers. Um, this is true for general requirement reporting for SAMHSA grants, but more so uh, the GIPA reporting requirements. Unfortunately, tribes and tribal organizations frequently find them find that reporting requirements use more resources than the SAMHSA funding allows for. Um, currently, SAMHSA grants are set with a 20% administrative cap, but grantees are frequently finding that in order to complete the reporting requirements, they have to add additional resources to their programs to, uh, to meet the, the needs of, of SAMHSA. Many tribes and tribal organizations lack the time, the staff, and you'd kind of covered this, Kimberly, uh, and the resources to meet the GIPA reporting requirements. Because of this, they are unable to apply for those grants or unable to accept those grants or even, even start the administra that administrative process of applying for grants because they just can't hire the staff to uh, to make sure that they're following through on the reporting requirements. Frequently, the cost of uh, data collection and reporting hinders tribes' ability to apply for funding. Uh, take that COVID, uh, take the COVID funding. We are grateful for SAMHSA's expedi expedious delivery of the COVID funds. However, the reporting, uh, GIPA re reporting requirements on these grants took more time than delivering the services. Additionally, the cost of gathering and reporting uh, the GIPRO grant information costs more in staff and resources than the grant again provides itself. Uh, GIPRO reporting and questions and questionnaires are not culturally competent uh, for Alaska Natives and uh, American Indian patients and participants. Um, often we find, uh, with that said, uh, we have a few recommendations. First, we recommend that tribes be exempt from GIPA rep reporting requirements. Uh, so more resources can go directly to services instead of being directed towards those administrative uh, needs of uh, and burdens of oppressive data collection, data entry, data reporting. It's important that SAMHSA let tribes decide how best to report or at least to work with tribes on, on uh, meaningful reporting requirements so that both SAMHSA and tribes can can meet those requirements. Um, secondly, HHS agencies, including SAMHSA, and you had mentioned this, should align the reporting uh, and improve consistencies across uh, all agencies, HRSA, IHS, GIPA reporting measures uh, to reduce the burden on us as providers and, and tribes. And lastly, we request that SAMHSA maintain the ability to collect GIPA data via telephone or other electronic means, uh, web-based surveys or et cetera. Uh, these questionnaires uh, completion modalities have created an easier means for tribal patients uh, and clients to provide information, uh, boost response rates and likely improve data um, overall. Yeah, so I just want to thank you for, for that comment and for the specific rec recommendations. It, it really helps when we can get concrete recommendations. Um, do know that we're looking at the, we're looking at the GIPRA uh, tool uh, and have started a cross-center uh, process within SAMHSA uh, where we're, we're looking at um, the data elements. We've gotten a lot of feedback. Uh, that they're not culturally responsive. Many of the areas that you mentioned in terms of the amount of time it takes um, and resource it takes um, and many different recommendations uh, related to ways that the, the uh, data collection uh, can be improved and enhanced. Um, so know that we're, we're looking at that. Again, appreciate the, the specific feedback and recommendations. We may follow up uh, and, and have other engagements related to and discussions related to uh, 
the, the GIPRAs and, and what would work. Uh, I like the recommendation that you had related to, um, you know, working with tribes and having discussions around um, meaningful reporting. Um, and so that, that is, you know, certainly those are discussions uh, that, that we would welcome um, as part of our overall thinking uh, related to, you know, ways to, to update the GIPRA, um, you know, just the GIPRA data collection process. Um, some of what, you know, some of what the, the sort of tension is here is often the, um, we get asked about, you know, how is this program or how is that funding program, you know, how is it doing? Um, I'll be, I'll be direct. I mean, through my confirmation process, that was probably one of the questions that came up quite a bit um, is that um, the data related to how our various grant programs is, is of interest. Um, you know, people are interested in that to see how are the, the various resources that we've been given, um, how are they being used and are they improving behavioral health outcomes? So it's important for us to, to somehow, you know, come up with a way where, where we're able to, um, to share that, to, to come up with a way of reporting the, the really, I mean, creative, innovative, awesome work actually that, that's going on, uh, you know, across our tribal communities and our grantees. And so that's the tension. On the one hand, you know, people want and need, and we need the information to be able to show that, look, these dollars are making a difference. <laughs> They're making a difference. People are working hard uh, to help people recover uh, and move into recovery. Um, but we do hear and get that, you know, if you're connecting with a person for the first time, uh, it could be, it, it sometimes is a barrier if the first thing, or one of the first things you're doing is launching into a set of questions. So we're, you know, we're, we hear that and, and no, I know this is a long response, but, but I did want to just share a little bit in terms of our sort of internal process. Um, we hear that and we're working on it um, to be able to uh, come up with something that is meaningful, um, but not as onerous. So, so stay tuned. Yes, again, thank you for that information and response. Um, and thank you to our fellow board members for kicking off those questions. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, elected tribal leaders in the audience to ask questions, um, share their comments and provide recommendation. Um, if you would like to speak, please put your name in the chat box. Uh, NHB will unmute you and you can ask your question uh, directly to our panelists. Uh, we ask that you please start by uh, sharing your name, your title and your tribe. Uh, once you are unmuted, we also invite you to turn your camera on so that we can see you as you ask your question. Uh, do we have any questions? We have one from Chairman Aaron Pamel. Great. Ani Buju, how do I turn my camera on? You should be able to you do it normally, or uh, Chairman Pamel or Oak. Going to be able to turn my camera on. There. <laughs> we can see you, Chairman. Okay, and there's an echo, but I'm not sure why. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, maybe somebody has to turn their mic off. Hello? Hello? Why is doing that? Maybe if I turn the phone off and just use the computer. All right, can you hear me? Great. All right, I think we're good. I turned my, my phone off. All right, so I'm a chairperson of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, Buju. Uh, I serve also on the HHS stack, uh, the SAMHSA Tribal Advisory the NIH Tribal Advisory and the former chair of the Office of Minority Health Health Research Advisory. Uh, most importantly, I have several immediate family members, nieces, uh, who are suffering from opiate, meth, heroin, suboxone, and alcohol addiction, including um, several who have lost their children, their homes, and all of their belongings. Um, some are homeless uh, while others are incarcerated. Um, so I'm the chairperson of the tribe um, I'm from a typical family, but nobody is exempt from, uh, from this uh, epidemic. Before the pandemic, we were suffering through this epidemic. And I want to highlight 
um, you know, some of the stats, how our community has been impacted by the opiate epidemic. A national study reported that American and Alaska Natives experienced the highest prescription opiate death rate of any demographic in 2017. And we also had the highest percentage increase in prescription opiate deaths between 2016 and 2017 at 10.8%. Starting in FY 2018 and again in 2019, Congress enacted 5% set-asides in opiate response grants for tribes and tribal organizations and a 10% set-aside for medically assisted treatment. We're grateful for this. Tribal leaders have been working for years for, uh, with federal officials to understand the origins of our outcomes in Indian country as documented in the Broken Promises Report stemming from historical and intergenerational trauma. The recent commitment by Secretary Holland to recover our children left behind at mission boarding schools is a step in the right direction for full healing, but in the meantime, tribal communities suffer from the effect of federal Indian policy. Our ask is not reparations, but reconciliation and full implementation of the treaty and trust obligation, which will go a long way to helping us to heal. A couple years ago, other tribal leaders and I worked with SAMHSA, the NIHB and NCAI to write the Tribal Behavioral Health Agenda. This is a really good document. It describes what I just explained and prescribes solutions steeped in our language, our culture, our traditional identity and revival and interventions that flow from our traditional medicines. So I have a number of uh, recommendations and a question. Uh, so my recommendation is to increase access to residential youth transitional systems like long-term recovery campuses, uh, pilot projects that blend state-of-the-art behavioral healing methods with promising traditional practices. SAMHSA should maintain the tribal set aside for opiate money so that tribes can continue to uh, build their prevention, treatment, and recovery infrastructure and capacity. Currently, only one tribe receives direct funding from SAMHSA through the Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grant. We request that the block grant be open for tribal, uh, more tribal participation. I'm also asking that we invert the paradigm, create templates for implementation and compact for these funds rather than competitive grant funding, allow for adaptation along a participatory action research approach. Um, and th there's continues to be some co conflict in response from from SAMHSA. At this level, at this at the stack level, I've a I'm asking for clarity about how we can use our uh, opiate response implementation grants. At this level, it's reaffirmed that we have flexibility because there's a matrix of addictions between alcohol, marijuana, uh, and opiates, heroin, um, any number of substances. But at the line level, we're advised that we are restricted to using those funds only for opiate, uh, uh, opiate um, diagnoses. And so if we can get that clarified, um, but I'm asking that we have great flexibility in being able to implement because people go back and forth uh, when they sustain their addictions from opiates to other addictions. SAMHSA should double fund the tribal behavioral health grants for substance abuse prevention and mental health and expand program flexibility to permit tribes to implement projects that are uniquely tailored to meet our community needs. Where possible, the agency should use its discretion to increase the set aside given the higher needs in our community. These funds should be expanded and compacted to meet the needs of tribes rather than relegate our use to a bureaucratic maze of implementation. SAMHSA should engage in meaningful and robust tribal consultation to discuss opportunities and strategies for restructuring the program as formula-based, um, which many tribes prefer. So my question, cultural and traditional interventions need to be included along with the Western methods of prevention. It can be hard to put val a value on our traditional interventions, but they work for tribal people. Can we work on a report on full implementation of the tribal behavioral health agenda blueprint and how we are addressing the needs across departments and across agencies. Thank you. I was muted, yes. No, I, I appreciate your, well, for one, sharing about your, your family story um, and, and for your service and commitment to, to behavioral health and, and to ensuring that um, tribal communities get the supports uh, and services that they need. So, um, so thank you for sharing. Um, and, and I wish your family, uh, you know, well in terms of addressing those challenges. Um, so, you know, I, I appreciate also your specific and concrete recommendations. 
um, because that does help us in terms of what the, you know, what the challenges are and, and in terms of ways we can approach those challenges. Um, I'll start with the TOR, the TOR grant, so the Tribal Opioid Response Grant. Um, so though that grant can be used for uh, programs or services or, or uh, initiatives that address opioids and stimulant use disorder, um, opioids and stimulant use disorder. Um, you know, of course, there are, um, we see a lot of polysubstance use, and so there may be individuals that are struggling with alcohol um, and either of those other two substances and certainly could, could participate in a, in a, uh, a TOR-funded initiative. Um, and so that is the current language as, uh, as passed by Congress, of course. Um, in terms of looking at programs, you know, and, and you're right on in terms of uh, uh, being able to incorporate or just the importance of incorporating uh, culturally congruent uh, responses and strategies. Uh, and in the short time that I've been assistant secretary, um, I've I've so appreciated learning about some of the innovations there. We, we are open to that, to, to culturally congruent strategies and practices being incorporated um, you know, with traditional practices, with, with some of the evidence-based practices. And so that is, that's pretty wide in terms of you know, being able to incorporate uh, you know, cultural, and we can have further conversations about that in terms of what that looks like, but, but we're, we're fairly flexible there. Um, and my interest and passion across my career has been sort of finding innovative ways to do just this, um, because we know that it's important to be able to um, incorporate uh, cultural beliefs and values and worldview and tradition as part of the healing process. Um, so certainly continue to engage with us on that. Um, and, and there's opportunity here potentially even for, um, you know, setting up conversations around sort of uh, learning about sort of cross community learning around some of the innovations um, that have been put in place that incorporate a, a range of traditional practices. So it's a long way of saying, yes, we're, we're absolutely open to that and let's continue to have those discussions. Um, I did wanna add, give Kimberly an opportunity to respond as well. Um, but again, thank you for your, for your uh, questions and comments and, and we can continue. You're, you're engaged in many different stack and other places. So, so we can continue these discussions as well through some of that work. Thank you. And Chairman Payment, I just want to mention that the uh, government project officers that oversee the core grant are my colleagues. We've had discussions about the availability of grant funding to be used for stimulants. So if you continue to have a problem, please contact me directly. There should not be a problem at any level in SAMHSA that that is an allowable expense. So I just want to, to mention that. Um, I also want to mention that the tour grantees for fiscal year 20 and our new grantees for fiscal year 21 also received supplemental funding because we know that the need is so great. So we were able to, to provide additional funding um, for that. And um, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, internally, what we've um, begun to have happen, which we think is a good thing, is have other project officers that oversee other grants that may not be tribal only grants, but have tribal grantees reach out to us to say, you know, my grantee asked for this um, item, a, a boat or food for a cultural practice. Can you talk us through that? So we are open to all those conversations and we're trying to educate our other government project officers within our agency yet, yeah, but that yes, these are allowable expenses um, and they are consistent with cultural tradition and cultural practices and, and we should encourage that. So I just wanted to mention that as well. I believe we have a hand raised, uh, Chief, uh, Chief Bill Smith. Thank you, Sam. Uh, I am uh, William Smith. I am the chair of the National Health Board and also the Alaska Area Representative and the Valdez uh, Native Tribe Vice Chair. Um, my question is on mental health and suicide prevention. Alaska Natives American Indian families and communities are strong and resilient. However, suicide remains a devastating force, particularly for our youth. 
Among Native youth, average suicide rates among 15 to 19 year olds from 2000 to 2016 were almost quadrupled the national rate and almost more than doubled the national average for the 20 to 24 year olds. In fact, American Indians and Alaska Natives under the age of 44 has significant higher rate suicide rates than any other uh, racial group. Multiple factors contribute to these devastation stat uh, statistics. Uh, these factors included exposure to violence and trauma, mental health disorders, alcohol and drug misuse, lower rate of access to mental health service, and a higher prevalence of experience with discrimination. We urge uh, needed additional support for mental health service and prevention programs uh, for our communities. And I also want to state uh, with the stand down in Afghanistan uh, with our uh, brothers and sisters coming home. Uh, as a Vietnam vet, I have seen uh, suicide uh, among our returning uh, warriors. So it's very important that uh, we have the mental health and suicide prevention. So I really have two requests for you. SAMHSA should uh, continue to support the American Indian Alaska Native Suicide Prevention Initiatives. Tribes have requested that the current funding get tripled from uh, five to 15 million for physical year 2023 due to the traumatic needs. Also, the agents should continue expanding uh, tribes access to the Garrett Lee Smith Suicide Prevention Grant Program. And the second request is furtherly, Sampson should do everything possible to allow tribes to access community mental health uh, services block grants, which provides millions of dollars each year to the states and territories. Can the agency provide any, any information on those needs to help allow the tribal access? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, I'll ask Kimberly to start there and, and then I'll, I'll provide some concluding comments as well. But I do appreciate your comments and, and questions and know that we are looking at all kinds of ways to be able to offer ongoing um, and expanded support as much as possible. Um, Kimberly? I muted myself, sorry. <laughs> um, the Garrett Lee Smith is open to tribes and tribal organizations. It's my understanding that the most recent was for colleges and universities. And there was a tribal university that was funded through that program. So that is currently open. Um, your other question was about the block grant. And I know that there is, um, as mentioned before, one tribe that is currently funded through the block grant, the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians in Minnesota. Um, and that is the way it's been, I think, for 20 years. So certainly something we can take a look at. Um, and I'll turn it back over to the Assistant Secretary to, to continue the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, so we are looking at different sort of funding me mechanisms. This is a request that we've received quite a bit. Um, and so know that we're, we're looking at that and can certainly follow up. Uh, and then in terms of the... You know, one, one other, I think, real valuable resource uh, related to sort of addressing some of the suicide uh, patterns and just struggles that people are having across the country is, you know, as you know, we're working on an initiative around uh, the, the suicide lifeline, suicide prevention lifeline. Um, and so in July 2022, that 10-digit number will be switched to a three-digit number, 988, um, and we'll be working with communities and states around expanding the resources related to crisis responsiveness and suicide prevention um, to be able to enhance access uh, to services and supports. Um, so stay tuned related to that, but that is a nationwide initiative that will impact tribal communities as well. Uh, and so it, it is an initiative geared towards really just what you're speaking about, Chairman, the, the increased patterns and trends that we're seeing across the country and certainly you know, within tribal communities, uh, the, the trends that you mentioned are, are heartbreaking. And so our aim really is to be able to increase access to services and supports um, through this expanded uh, suicide prevention crisis line, which will be converted to 988. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, information. Uh... I talked with the VA the other day and I said the same thing, you know, and they said, let's just put this long, long number in our phone in case a veteran needs to uh, call it. 
And I told him, I said, you know, we got 911, we got deal. And if I have to dig around my house, I just do 811 and I get all kinds of services. I get the electric company, the water company, the gas co company, all those deals. And a person in crisis shouldn't have to figure out how to dial a long number to get it. So I would really love to see that short number come in and just quick access because you and I both know that just maybe a split second could save someone's life. So I appreciate the, that, and I'd really like to see that number come yesterday, not today or tomorrow. So Awata, and thank you. Back to you, Sam. Yes, thank you, uh, uh, William Smith, uh, Chief Smith. Um, at this time, we're getting close to our closing sessions. We also uh, did provide an email within the chat box to uh, either send your information via comments or via email. We'll get that as part of the record and information to SAMHSA. Um, at this time, I would uh, like to turn it over to Beverly to make some closing comments. Uh, thank you again, Sam. Thank you to all our tribal leaders that shared questions and comments. If we do not have any other elected tribal leaders that wish to speak, we will now turn to our other audience. Um, I don't know. Oh, I think we're at, uh, a little further down on, on the agenda to the closing. So I guess the plan now is just to skip this portion. Yes, ma'am. And to go down to closing comments. Yes, thank you, Beverly. Uh, and thank you, uh, Delfina Rittman, Dr. Rittman. Uh, we appreciate you with being with us today and we appreciate all the comments as Beverly had stated from tribal elected leaders. Uh, we'll be following up with you and your team on issues discussed today. We know that having this time is important and it's also critical uh, for us to keep track of the progress and recommendations that were made. We trust that your agency will help support our recommendations and tribal leaders across Indian country and we'll, we'll work to in partnership to make sure that lawmakers also know what our priorities are. We invite you all to visit our virtual exhibit hall that opens at the top of the hour and join us this afternoon for the COVID roundtable that starts at 1230 Eastern. And, and please enjoy the rest of the today's workshops. Uh, we will also be partnering with uh, uh, Health Resource Services Administration, HRSA, to host a formal tribal consultation on Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we hope that you can join us uh, for that session. Thank you again to our speakers and our audience members. Please take a few minutes uh, at the end of the session to fill out the evaluation form. Uh, you can find the link uh, that says, please fill out this session evaluation under the session description on the session page, uh, hopefully. Uh, on, online conference agenda. Uh, this feedback is critical uh, for the work that we do as an IHB, and it helps us improve our listening sessions and our tribal consultations, uh, our co yeah, tribal consultations sessions for, for the future conferences. On behalf of the entire NIHB board, uh, we wish you a good week and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, miigwech for joining us today. Uh -huh. Thank you.